So good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our weekly webinar series. Uh, it's uh, always a pleasure to uh, be with all of you and have this collective learning every week. Today, we will take up some important NCLT and important judgments in the field of IBC. Uh, over to Anand, sir. Thank you, Ankit. So it is 65th episode and continuously without any break every Saturday at 11 a.m. And we feel pleasure into it. See, the subject that today we chose is the uh, nine unclad judgments where some issues are clarified and some issues are freshly adjudicated. So without wasting any time, we will take you to our PPT, which is on nine NCLAT judgments, very, very recent judgments. So the issues regarding eviction of properties, the powers of successful resolution applicant to pursue avoidance transactions applications, also the power of the liquidator to forfeit the earnest money deposits. So, and there is a, a good a judgment, good observation in preferential transactions so all this is going to be the part of today's deliberations. And we, as you know, we always welcome questions. So in case you can post your questions in Q and A tab on the YouTube, we would be able to take up the questions in between also, or even at the end of it also. Just sharing my uh, uh, PPT. Okay, so Ankit, the very first judgment is our own, uh, which we fought. This is Nitin Jain versus Universal Tutorial Private Limited. Nitin Jain is a partner of AAA Insolvency, and that is in the case of PSL Limited, the company. And this judgment is as recent as 23rd of May, 2023. And this judgment is on the rights of the liquidator to seek eviction of the properties where it has been unauthorizedly occupied by someone. I'm repeating unauthorized occupation of the properties. That's where this particular judgment would be applicable. So in this case, uh, the PSL Limited, in fact, uh, is, is a company in liquidation and the appeal was preferred by the liquidator against the order of NCLT Ahmedabad. Now the facts of the case is that the uh, Universal Tutorial Private Limited was a tenant of one of the properties of PSL Limited and the tenancy is as old as 2005. So the first tenancy was for 11 years which expired in October 2016 and then again the suspended management extended it for 33 months and the last the validity of the lease or leave and license agreement was up to 31st of July 2019. And the CIRP started in February 2019. That means that this further this leave and license agreement could not be extended because the CIRP started in February 19 and the leave and license expired in July 19. So it was not extended by the suspended management, even the RP also did not renewed it or extended it. Rather, RP started giving them notices and that the, you vacate the uh, premises and the uh, RP in fact filed an application to NCLT Ahmedabad that the direction may be issued to Universal Tutorial Private Limited to vacate the premises of the corporate data in Nami Mumbai. But the NCLT Ahmedabad said that the, the appellant may proceed to file eviction suit in proper court as the NCLT will not like to indulge into the eviction matters. Eviction is not the jurisdiction of NCLT. And that too, when the leave and license agreement was expired and there was no renewal by the liquidator. So this was a case where the property was owned by the corporate debtor. There was no valid leave license or the lease agreement. 
and the tenant was not vacating and the application of the liquidator to the adjudicating authority was rejected based on the jurisdiction and the liquidator was directed to go and appropriate don't go to the appropriate court uh, as per the maharashtra uh, tenancy act now the basic question before the nclat was whether nclt have jurisdiction in ordering eviction of the premises of the corporate debtor or not now the question here is you know the appellant appellant says appellant in this case is uh, like nitin jain nitin jain says the liquidator the liquidator says the section 63 of the code provides that no civil court or authority shall have jurisdiction to entertain any suit or proceedings in respect of any matter which nclt or nclt nclt has jurisdiction so therefore the question comes whether it the nclt or nclt has jurisdiction or not now then the coming in the leave and license agreement has expired due to efflux of time and thus it is the um, the liquidator is empowered to approach the nclt the liquidator in fact placed reliance on the supreme court judgment in the case of arcelor mittal india versus private limited versus sish mar gupta and also embassy properties property development private limited versus state of karnataka and others even in the case of alchemist asset reconstruction company versus precision fasteners limited was also relied upon however the main argument from the liquidator was a very very recent judgment of nclat which was a three bench judgment that was in the case of janvi rajpal janvi rajpal automotive private limited versus the resolution professional of rajpal abikaran so that it means that these are the associate concerns and the associate concerns has taken the properties on rent so this particular judgment came handy and this judgment was only dated 5th of january 2023 now now the respondent the tenant the tenant says that the present dispute is a civil dispute it is a dispute regarding eviction from the property so the adjudicating authority doesn't have any jurisdiction the liquidator has already been permitted by the nclt to file an eviction suit in the appropriate court further the tenant says that the nclt has given necessary permission to liquidator and also and the, the they were relying on the nclat judgment in the case of kl jute products private limited versus tirupati jute industries limited and others then they were saying that the ibc is a complete code in itself and it, you can't enlarge the jurisdiction so then they also referred gurja the gujarat urja vikas nigam limited versus amit gupta and also tata consultancy services limited versus sk wheels private limited now all this considered and the ncl nclt observed that section 60 sub section 5 of the insolvency and bankruptcy code shows that any application by or against the corporate debtor has to be heard only by nclt and not by any other forum so the reliance was also placed on arcelor mittal india private limited versus tish kumar gupta and it was said that this judgment has been incorrectly relied upon by the uh, respondent and the it says in fact paragraph 83 of that judgment says the non obstante clause in section 60 sub section 5 is designed for a different purpose to ensure that the nclt alone has jurisdiction when it comes to applications and proceedings by or against a corporate debtor covered by the code making it clear that no other forum has jurisdiction to entertain or dispose of such applications or proceedings this was the observation of nclat and further the nclat said that honorable supreme court in embassy property development private limited versus state of karnataka and others has it, it it was also held that it has appropriately determined the jurisdiction of adjudicating authority to decide all types of claims with property of the corporate debtor section 63 of the code provides that no civil court or authority shall have the jurisdiction to enter any suit or proceedings in respect of any matter 
where NCLT or NCLT has jurisdiction. Much more, again, NCLT said that this, type, this kind of matter was held and decided by the three bench, three member bench of NCLAT in the case of Janvi Rajpal Automotive Private Limited versus Resolution Professional of Rajpal Abhikaran Private Limited. And this was a judgment on 5th of January 2023. A similar issue arose wherein the lease of the respondent came to an end. So the first condition is the lease of the respondent came to an end and the premises of the corporate debtor was not vacated. This tribunal held in paragraph 20 of that judgment, accepting the contentions of the learned counsel for the appellant that the RP is obliged to file a suit for eviction of the appellant under MP Accommodation Control Act because that particular judgment was from Maharashtra, uh, from Madhya Pradesh. So the, if the RP will go to Madhya Pradesh Accommodation Control Act, even though lease in favor of the appellant has expired, shall be unduly prolonging the insolvency process, which is a time-bound process. When the corporate debtor has the ownership rights over the premises, which premises can be taken in control by IRP, RP, we are of the view that the eviction of the appellant, especially in the event when the lease in favor of the appellant has come to an end, Filing a suit is not contemplated in the statutory scheme contained in the IBC. And finally, the decision of the ANCLAT was that in view of Janvi Rajpal Automotive Private Limited versus Resolution Professional of Rajpal Abhikaran, which was passed by three member bench in ANCLAT, and it was also upheld by the Honorable Supreme Court. The three member bench of judgment is binding on us. So the NCLAT said that this three member is, is binding on us. The impugned order dated 10th of February 2021 passed by the adjudicating authority was set aside because that was done on the jurisdictional issue and the adjudicating authority was directed to pass a fresh order considering the jurisdiction is available with them. So this was the judgment of Nitin Jain versus the tenant and in the case of PSL. Now, like since it is a similar issue, now we let us try to understand what exactly happened in Janvi Rajpal Automotive Private Limited. That was a judgment in 5th of January. So in that judgment, which was a three member bench, again, it was a, a the scenario where the Rajpal Abhikaran is the corporate debtor, is the owner of an immovable property. In that immovable property, uh, Janvi Rajpal Automotive Private Limited was the tenant and it was an unregistered lease deed. When the corporate debtor was admitted into CIRP and the premises the, uh, formed part of the information memorandum prepared by the resolution profession, the tenant was requested to vacate the premises. Means the Janvi Rajpal Automotive Private Limited, the tenant, he was requested to vacate the premises. At that time, tenant said, that he will vacate within 10 days of the final approval of the resolution plan. So RP also believed that it will, there is a cooperation because I believe because the names are similar, I believe that this is also a promoter, the promoter company or a related company. So when this resolution plan was approved, the it was approved for a person called Agarwal Real City Private Limited. And then the tenant, then the tenant, Janvi Rajpal Automotive Private Limited, declined to declined to vacate and asked the resolution applicant to go to a civil court and seek. And see, like they also, uh, the tenant also actually instituted a civil court before the civil court in Dor, seeking permanent injunction against the resolution professional from taking over the premises. So while they were making a promise to RP that they will vacate in 10 days, they filed a civil suit seeking permanent injunction. So then the RP filed an application to uh, NCLT and NCLT in that particular case uh, said that the directed the tenant to vacate the premises within 15 days. And that is the reason against that order, the tenant came to the 
appeal before NCLAT. Whether NCLT has the power to order vacating the premises of the corporate debtor, that was the question of law. The question of law I'm repeating, whether the NCLT has power to order vacation, vacating the premises of the corporate debtor. Now the contention of the appellant is that the, again, they relied on the uh, Supreme Court judgment in the case of Embassy Property Developments Private Limited, stating that NCLT does not have jurisdiction to adjudicate civil disputes. RP is obliged to file eviction suit in M MP Accommodation Control Act. Now the NCLAT said, the first of all, the NCLAT said that the bench observed that Section 18 of the IBC empowered the IRP or RP to take control and custody of the asset owned by the corporate debtor, whether or not in the possession of the corporate debtor. For effectuating the duty under Section 18 of the IBC, recourse to adjudicating authority by filing an application under Section 60, subsection 5 is available. So filing of an eviction suit under the MP Accommodation Control Act would unduly delay the process of CIRP since it's a time-bound process would vitiate the entire objective of IBC. Then the bench observed when the corporate debtor has the ownership rights over the premises, which premises can be taken control under, under Section 18, we are of the view that the eviction of the appellant, especially in the event when the lease in favor of the appellant has come to an end, Filing a suit is not complemented in the statutory scheme. Decision of the NCLAT final upheld the adjudicating authority's decision to allow the application and directing the tenant to vacate the premises so that approved resolution plan can be implemented. Now the tenant also goes to Supreme Court. <clears throat> the tenant also goes to Supreme Court and the Supreme Court in the very first hearing, very, very summarily says in that order dated 10th of February, 2023, now look at the speed, look at the speed. This particular NCLAT order was dated 5th of January, 2023. So 10th of February, between in 35 days, even the appeal was filed before the Supreme Court and order was also given. Now, what is the order? The order is that we do not find any ground to interfere in the order impugned dated 5th of January, 2023, passed by the NCL 80, passed by the NCL 80. The appeal is accordingly dismissed, keeping the question of law open. Keeping the question of law open. So that's a very, very important part that the Supreme Court says that the question of law is still open. What is the question of law? The question of law is whether the NCLT or NCL 80 has the jurisdiction to evict tenants from the properties. However, my analysis is one that the in the case of Nitin Jain, as well as in the case of uh, this Janvi Rajpal automotive, both the cases, the lease has actually been expired. After the expiry of the lease, it was unauthorized occupation, which was by the tenant. Third, that property was part of the liquidation estate or part of the resolution process or part of the information memorandum. Section 18 says that the RP has to take control and custody. So therefore, this case is a unique case. These Both these cases are unique cases. However, we cannot apply these cases to those particular cases where the valid lease is subsisting. In case a valid lease subsists, I don't understand that RP or the liquidator has the power to seek eviction unless the agreement of lease provides for vacation or termination of the lease agreement, then it will be a kind of jurisdiction of the appropriate court, which court will handle the eviction or tenancy matters. In this case also, the Supreme Court has kept the question of law open However, in this particular case, they never wanted to interfere because this was a case, one, that the promise was made by the tenant within two, to be uh, to uh, vacate within 10 days. Further, after the resolution plan is approved, then they probably thought that uh, now we can fight. Uh, uh, this may be a case that they were also trying to take it over, uh, take over the company through other um, uh, modes, but which they were not successful. But now, <clears throat> see, this can, this particular judgment or even the Supreme Court reference can only be 
used for those cases where the lease is expired. Yes, Sankit. Now the one subject we have concluded. I think you can see <clears throat> what can be. So we, so we we have discussed this multiple times in the past that internationally when a company goes into bankruptcy, the bankruptcy court gets ample powers to protect the, protect the assets of the, the company which has gone into bankruptcy and it has kind of has uh, powers which are beyond the simple insolvency matters also and originally and if you read 63 then uh, where, as we just referred to that a while back. It does talk about how all the matters will go to NCLT or NCLAT and therefore this court will become the central place for all actions. The another thought process here was that the RP or the liquidator would not have to go to different courts and do, you know, at, and be present in different forums. Only one forum, one court will handle all the, all the uh, litigations with respect to that CD and with respect to preserving the assets of that CD. So I think this is a welcome step, but then the it's good that this eviction order or this this order has come in from NCLT and NCLAT in this matter, in Nitin Jain's matter. Uh, but uh, of course, the 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 true uh, relief uh, which will come out will be in case there is a decision from the Honorable Supreme Court that NCLT and NCLAT are having rights over other matters also. So like questions are with respect to recovering an amount from a debtor again we as rps have to go to different forums to get that then of course in the if the lease is still valid and the terms of the lease are not uh the terms of the lead either provide for a termination and the termination happens in the middle of the lease period then again maybe this this uh, uh this judgment can be used by somebody to say that the lease is terminated and the termination is valid and therefore the eviction should also be permitted by nclt so this is of course possible, but the whole idea that the question of law is open is is the is what I think needs to be settled early so that this relief can then come to various processes. Other than that, that uh, right, Ankit, because yeah. see, like this question, whether the eviction things, I think you have rightly, very rightly, you have said that there are two things which are still pending. One, in case the liquidator terminates the lease then whether it will be the jurisdiction of NCLT or NCLAT or not. Secondly, for recovery of any amount from any particular party as its entry data or any advances given, whether the liquidator is in power to go to NCLT or the liquidator will have to go to all kinds of recovery courts in the country. So these are the matters which are still to be <clears throat> uh, decided by Honorable Supreme Court regarding the jurisdiction because what, <clears throat> what in fact is required in case you see, <clears throat> in case you ask the liquidator that you go to every kind of uh, court because see, let us try to understand the winding up under the earlier company's law. In that company law, everything was before a high court judge. Even the recovery was also before the high court judge. The official liquidator under the Companies Act was not required to go from court to court, run from the recovery courts of all states based on the jurisdiction. So that was a concentrated power on high court so that the liquidation can be achieved. In this case also, in fact, the structure of the uh, IBC has been made in such manner that no other court will have any jurisdiction where NCLT and NCLT has jurisdiction. And in case we see section 60 subsection five. So Ankit, in fact, I saw section 60 subsection five also so when we see that section, so it actually say, <clears throat> it actually says any application or proceeding by or against the corporate debtor or corporate person that would be the jurisdiction of NCLT. So this is what the section 60 subsection five says. So any application means any application. So it it is not supposed to be uh, like this is yes this is no. So anyway, I think there's still the issues are pending regarding various uh, jurisdictional issues. <clears throat> I believe the Honorable NCL, uh, Supreme Court or even the lawmakers can look into this or clarify because presently, liquidly, presently the liquidators are not able to recover the money uh, because of the uh, tardy processes in various courts. May it be commercial court, may it be 
negotiable instrument accords may it be other normal recovery processes one reason that the uh, relevant document which are required for filing such cases as is also not available with the the with the rp or the liquidator so therefore it is actually becoming a therefore the liquidation processes are not being closed for years going forward ankit we actually have to go to the, the other judgment the third judgment of the day kapil vadavan versus piramal capital and housing finance limited uh, this is in the case of corporate debtor is the divan housing finance corporation in short we call, call it dhfl limited dhf dhfc limited so this uh, case is on section uh, uh, this case is on section 40 Three section forty-five. So in this case, as you know, this uh, DHFL was a uh, company engaged in financial services, financial service provider. So this was a company where the RBI, RBI superseded the board of directors of Divan Housing Finance Corporation and appointed an administrator. And the administrator is supposed to conduct the insolvency process of DHFL under the insolvency and bankruptcy. insolvency and liquidation proceedings of financial service providers and application to adjudicating authority rules 2019 nclt admitted the case and the administrator was performing all the functions during the cirp the administrator filed various applications under section uh, 25 43 44 66 of the ibc praying for the avoidance of certain transactions undertaken by dhf now in the meantime <clears throat> piramal capital and housing finance limited became the successful resolution applicant and submitted the resolution plan which was approved by the coc however in the resolution plan there was a clause which stated that the successful resolution applicant will pursue avoidance transactions application filed by the administrator therefore the piramal filed application seeking its in that in impediment substitution in place of the erstwhile administrator in the pending avoidance application after the takeover was implemented nclt substituted the name of uh, piramel in place of the erstwhile administrator and the kapil vadavan the applicant here the appellant here being an ex promoter of the cooperator filed an appeal before nclt nclt so this order uh, challenging the order dated february 23 so the order was february 2023 where the name of the piramal was substituted by nclt in all those applications which were filed by the administrator under section 43 44 66 etc now in this case the only question of law was whether the successful resolution applicant can pursue the avoidance transaction application or not and the contention of the appellant was the appellant means kapil vadwa kapil kapil vadavan i think kapil vadavan is the name kapil vadavan yes kapil vadavan argued that the avoidance application which are not decided before the completion of cirp becomes infructuous post completion of cirp and approval of the resolution plan then he again said kap the kapil vadavan again said that the successful resolution applicant cannot continue prosecution of the avoidance application since the resolution professional is a persona designate a person designated by a court under ipc whose power and duties cannot be delegated further the kapil vadavan said that the different legal interest from the administrator and thus substitution would facilitate successful resolution applicant to act in his in its own interest in place of being impartial now ncl 80 in this case held that we rely on tata steel bsl limited versus venus recruiter private limited where it has been held that it cannot be accepted that the avoidance application will be rendered infructuous in situations wherein the resolution plan could not have accounted for avoidance of applications due to exigencies that delayed initiation of action in respect of avoidable transactions beyond the substitution of the resolution plan before the adjudicating authority again nclat said 
<clears throat> the regulation 38 of the CIRP regulation was inserted by notification dated 14.6.22 and it contained mandatory content. Now, what was there in regulation 38? <clears throat> regulation 38 says, let us try to see what was there in the regulation 38.2D. When I say regulation This, yes, I can find out regulation 38 and then we can reach out to the <clears throat> this class. The resolution this clause D says the resolution plan must provide for manner in which the proceedings in respect of avoidance transactions, if any, under chapter 3 or fraudulent or willful trading under chapter 6 of part 2 of the code will be pursued after the approval of resolution plan and the manner in which the proceeds if any from such proceeds shall be distributed provided that this clause shall not apply to any resolution plan that has been substituted that has been submitted to adjudicating authority under subsection 6 of section 30 on or before the date of commencement of this particular amendment. Now, the date of commencement of this particular amendment was 14th June 2022. So that's what was held in this case, that 14th June 2022, when the regulation was amended, although this particular resolution plan was submitted before that, however, it further says that the awareness will be pursued after the approval of the resolution plan and manner in which the proceeds will be distributed. However, the regulation would be inapplicable to a resolution plan submitted after the 14th of June 22 to NCLT for approval. In fact, it should be before. Now, going forward, the observ observation was that the successful resolutions resolution plan was approved prior to 14-6-2022 and contains specific provision for continuation of the awareness application by SRA. Therefore, such provision in the plan is not contrary to IBC. In fact, resolution plan, plan provided something in the resolution plan, which was in fact clarified later. It was clarified on 14th June 2022, whereas the resolution plan, plan provided the same thing even before that. So, regulation 38, sub regulation 2D, which is not specifically attracted with regard to the regulation plan in question. However, the legislative intent which has been brought in the regulation clarifies the law. So now then the bench says that the resolution plan has been approved and it is binding on all the stakeholders. But the decision was that the NCLT is held that the resolution plan specifically empowers SRA to pursue the avoidance applications. Then said provisions of the plan shall bind everyone, including the erstwhile administrator. The bench held that NCLT has rightly permitted the SRA to pursue the avoidance application which were filed by the erstwhile administrator and were pending before NCLT. So the appeal filed by Kapil Badaman was dismissed. So Ankit, any observation on this uh, law? Because this is something which is uh, on the successful resolution applicant's power. And so I think, so, so this this is just bring, the, the, bringing a deja vu moment for me, where yesterday itself when I was uh, having a discussion with the participants uh, of uh, uh, a session organized by ICMAI, IP, IPA of ICMAI. The question that was coming was that in liquidation, if the avoidance transactions are filed, then can the company be dissolved? Uh, can a dissolution application be processed by NCLT while these avoidance applications are filed? And the second question was that if the company is indeed dissolved or if the dissolution order is passed, who will follow up or who will you know, uh, complete the or com continue following up the avoidance transactions. So uh, this judgment is again uh, a validation of the idea that even in liquidation, there is a provision which says that the dissolution can happen even if the avoidance transactions are pending in NCLT. And uh, there again, one can always decide, I think, within the SCC, that what will be the mechanism in which the avoidance transactions will be continued to be followed up, whether the erstwhile liquidator will do it or maybe the majority creditor will do it. So all those things uh, can be taken up in the liquidation matter also. So I think this is very clear that avoidance transactions, pendency of them or rather follow up by, on, on them 
by the SRA or by any of the creditors. It's always something that can be allocated in any which manner as per the commercial wisdom or commercial arrangement between the resolution applicant and the creditors or the creditors and the liquidator. So, uh, Ankit, there is a hand raised by Mr. Shantanu T. Ray. <clears throat> can we take him in? Because see, the matters are, there are nine judgments. <coughs> and I think uh, we can make it a little more interactive. And in case there are specific questions from and uh, Shantanu T. Ray, and that's so in case Shantanu T. Ray is our senior partner. So I think let's that discussion. You also. can just you can just make me co-host so that I will be able to uh, you know uh, I will be able to permit him to speak. Yes, Tan. So in the meantime, we can stop uh, this share sharing of this screen and we can seek uh, the question of Shantanu T. Ray. Yeah. Am I audible now? Yes, please. Very yes. much. Am I audible? Yes, yes, Shantanu. Yes, you are. Uh, okay. So, I, my question here was, can the SCC also decide that the liquidator could continue the process of pursuing this application and not dissolve the company and authorize the liquidator to seek an extension uh, with the NCLT uh, for such a extension. So is that possible? In yeah, the see, let, us try to, let us try to understand, first of all, the obligations of the liquidator. The obligations of the liquidator is that he has to pursue all the avoidance transactions applications. And also he has to close the company, he has to dissolve the company within the stipulated timeline. But in case the applications are pending, he cannot run away. No, the liquidator has to assure, the liquidator has to assure that if these transactions applications are something which is a very, very tardy process, so he should try that if there is any assignment can be done as uh, not readily realizable asset regulation 37 capital A of the liquidation process regulations. So in case the liquidator is able to assign yeah. the contingent assets either to uh, the any of the financial creditor or any other creditor, or he can assign it with the consent of the stakeholders to any other third party, or he can even assign to any of his related party with the consent of the SCC then he can make an application for dissol dissolving the corporate debtor. What I am saying that without making an arrangement for the persuasion of the avoidance transactions application and how the same would be uh, distributed and who would be responsible for all this, the dissolution of a corporate debtor may not be acceptable. Even if you find the application, the NCLT will not accept that. So yeah. either, Either it has to be assigned to you in your personal capacity, not as a liquidator, to your company, to financial creditor, to any other creditor, to market as a whole, with the consent of the SCC. Without the consent of the SCC, it is not something that you can assign it to yourself and run away. Not possible. Precisely. precisely. So, so because uh, what happened is, uh, I had made an attempt. As you know, I am a liquidator in many cases. I had a made an attempt. There was a third party ready, but then what happens is uh, that thing says for a consideration, you know, the regulation says assigned for a consideration. So now the con party... consideration also can be contingent, sir. The consideration, uh, so, it may not be upfront, it can be contingent also. That is true. The contingent consideration was offered. The banker said, no, 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 without some upfront, we cannot uh, uh, assign it. Yeah. Our competent authorities will not uh, approve it. So you continue and you file an uh, application for one more year of uh, extension and you get some order and then we will see. So I, said so I, because believe, it, uh, I believe in some cases, in yeah. some cases even IBBI have also uh, reprimanded the insolvency professionals for not filing the dissolution application. That has happened. Some cases. 
so i would still i would still say that the liquidators when all the assets are sold should file a dissolution application and also the nclt should be uh, there should be a prayer that the financial creditor may be asked to take over the responsibilities of uh, transaction applications otherwise this process will continue see it is not only the process of uh, nclt then in case uh, and in case the, the entire all the applications are lost then the stakeholders will say that you file an application to nclad in case you won in case you win any of the applications then the respondents will go to ncl 80 and in case they still uh, uh, loses their case then they will go to supreme court so in case you don't try to dissolve the company don't try to take the directions from the nclt in try to tell them that the stakeholders are not agreeing to one proposal of mine second proposal of mine third proposal of mine they are not agreeing so what do i do so you are saving yourself from right. rep reprimandations of the ibbi and also in some cases i have seen that the nclt has also observed that the liquidator has not filed the dissolution applications for a very long period so you are you are saved from all this and in the meantime some directions will come from nclt to the creditors or alternatively uh, the they will say that the scc should consider these options given by the liquidator so therefore i advise that in all cases where the assets are sold one dissolution application should be submitted by stating that these are the only contingent assets which are left and these are subject to litigations and i have made effort number 1 effort number 2 effort number 3 but then there is no result coming in so therefore i apply for the dissolution with the prayer that the financial creditor may take over the responsibility of these litigations this is the best scenario as of today this is the best Because scenario. recently i had uh, attended a nclt proceeding where such thing came up where the liquidator had actually filed the yes. mumbai bench so they had already filed the dissolution so uh, the members said ki since this qf is ongoing how can we dissolve it absolutely they themselves said that so different benches are taking different uh, some, of the, some of the benches are saying that you go and close the liquidation account first then only will dissolve that is also happening that is also happening how that do you do that close. how do you do that because you are not sure when the uh, last uh, last last fee of the lawyer how would you pay that precisely then you have to so, pick, keep a provision so i what i did sir ki i uh, took a lump sum quote from lawyer saying baba whatever matter comes how much will you take gave that in advance and uh, then i have i am now closing the account because they are not dissolving bilkul we don't close out of that account yeah a new and new matters are coming up even in the uh, dead companies and this is everything is over still now some gst is coming up something or the other is coming up so, so i think uh, we can uh, take it yeah, forward continue sir continue sir yeah yeah please we can take it forward and uh, so, so one I mean, one question that has come in which might be taken which is based on the previous judgment that in case the sra wants a premises and the premises are on lease so the question is that is there any provision or any way that the rp can settle the tenancy rights or pay the tenant or pay the occupant and get the possession of those premises before the sra uh, becomes the sra or before the process continues is no, there I any think, process through which that can happen i think the as far as this part is concerned that there is a there is a valid tenancy and the valid tenancy is also a hurdle into the resolution process then the committee of creditors can decide to settle with the existing tenant and based on that settlement the resolution uh, plan can be uh, called that's one thing but you can't actually rp doesn't have a power to evict a person who has a valid lease agreement i don't that's, think that's the question the question is whether the tenancy can be settled by making a payment yes, to the it tenant can be it can be with, with with the approval of the committee of creditors and then because that's a hurdle in finding resolution all right and another another question there is that in case a tenant is there tenant is paying rent regularly and tenant as per the lease deed has also paid a security deposit 
will is there any way to repay this or pay the security deposit to the tenant in advance or the security deposit will have to be claimed by the tenant as a claim no see the security deposit is one part of the same person and the rent due is another part of the same person there's no in rent due there is in case there is a rent due and the security deposit both can set off with each other but there is no rent due let's say the rent is regular so in case the rent is regular and then there is a security deposit and he is already evicted he is already le left the premises the lease is expiring he, let's say then the lease is expiring then if the lease is expiring and he says that i am going but then i don't think then it becomes a liability of the company mm -hmm. that the person has vacated and his the security deposit is still pending with the company i cannot make payment of as an rp i cannot make payment of that security deposit and the other person will have to file a claim for this security deposit however in case he continues to occupy the premises and then he can adjust his outstanding rent with the security deposit that's the only way so that is doable you are saying that the security deposit can be adjusted security uh, deposit can be adjusted the... with the rent yeah it can post, be for the post the for the post cip period Yeah. For the post service period also, okay. Because this is there is a, a mutual set of which is allowed in the liquidation regulations and also in the law. So that actually will become applicable if one person has two accounts, and one is a debit, one is a credit. That is allowed to be set off. Well, there is only a timing difference here that if there is a payable balance as on CRP date and there was no receivable balance as on CRP date, will the mutual set off still happen? That's the big question. Anyways. I any other question uh we can move forward uh and uh, uh we can we can move forward okay so i'll just uh, uh open my screen uh, uh, and then so now i am moving on to west coast infra projects private limited versus mr ram chandra is the liquidator of uh, uh, the company called anil limited the judgment is again latest 28th of april 2023 it is from anclat and this judgment is also from justice ashok bhushan the uh, the, uh, the chairperson of NC nclat and the technical member mr barun mitra now in this case the uh, the liquidation commenced against messrs anil limited uh, and it was the nclt ahmedabad order and the liquidator issued a sale notice for e auction property west coast infra was the successful bidder the uh, because there was a delay in making payment by the bidder but then he requested the liquidator to give him 30 days period without any interest because the law says that within 30 days no interest the law says that the interest will be charged by the liquidator for another 60 days in case the payment is not made at the rate of 12% but then he was requesting that this interest for the delayed period of 30 days should be waived to me which was rejected by the liquidator saying that i have no power so the uh, then the liquidator notified uh, uh, that, that the balance has to be paid in accordance with the clauses of the liquidation process otherwise the earnest money deposit and the part payment made by him that will be forfeited and then based on that particular notice of the liquidator the appellant preferred an application before the adjudicating authority praying that particular notice of the liquidator say, say, may be quashed and set aside uh, and therefore the adjudicating dismissed the application and also imposed a cost of 5 lakhs of rupees on the successful bidder who was asking for one month interest free uh, interest free period and also he actually filed an application so he was actually put a cost of 5 lakhs now he was aggrieved and he went to nclat now the he was before the nclat he started arguing differently before adjudicating authority nclt he was arguing differently but now he started arguing as he said that the 70 section 74 of the indian contract act 1872 has actually some application in this case because the liquidator is charging liquidated damages to us and that liquidated damages is governed by section 74 of the indian contract act so the in, that the liquidated damages can be only in relation to that indian contract act and not as per the ibc so therefore the liquidator has no right to 
forfeit my earnest money deposit and also my partly part payment made. And secondly, section 74 provides for compensation for breach of contract where penalty stipulated is there. Now the appellant says section, section 74 of the contract act, the liquidator should have filed a lawsuit to recover the penalty as compensation. He was not ready to give that penalty under the Indian Contract Act. He was saying that you have to file a lawsuit to recover that compensation from me. So therefore, the uh, the insolvency and uh, bankruptcy court liquidation process regulations do not contain any provisions that allow funds used to acquire assets put up for sale to be forfeited. The liquidator has withhold the material fact. So then he also started finding some flaws into the process. He said that the property tax dues were not explained. He also said that there is some kind of areas and the land is liable to be attached. So that kind of uh, arguments started and the liquidator said, one, that the section 74 of the Indian Contract Act argument was never used before the adjudicating authority. Liquidator is guided by the regulations, so therefore he cannot allow more than 30 days interest free. And the liquidator said that because of the failure to deposit the remaining amount, the cancellation has happened and EMD and the parcel amount has been forfeited. Now the NCLT observed in this case that section 74 of the contract act would have no application. If the forfeiture takes place under the terms and conditions of a public auction before an agreement under section 74. So NCLAT says that if there is an agreement executed between the parties, then only the Indian Contract Act will come in picture and will be effective. So there was no agreement signed between the parties under section 74. So there was no liquidated damages and there was no compensation clause. There was no penalty clause. This was regulated by liquidation process regulations and the liquidator is bound by that. So there was then the NCLAT also said there was no title flaw and there was no the procedural flaws that we have seen. So therefore, the uh, liquidator is entitled to fixed terms and conditions. 74 section of contract act is not applicable and the uh, highest bidder will have to make the payment. And in case not made, the liquidator has a right to forfeit uh, the amounts, forfeit the amounts. So that's what is the judgment. Okay, so it is just making clear, although the concept was clear, but somebody who has taken it to NCLAT so it is making more clearer that NCLAT, uh, a liquidator has the power to forfeit. So the bidders uh, will not, bidders will not play with the process. See, going forward, we have now this GVR Consulting Services Private Limited versus Puja Bari. It is in the case of NTL Electronics India Private Limited. So this is again an important judgment uh, where the CIRP of NTL Electronics started and it was in Delhi and the RP was appointed and the transactions application was filed and some transactions applications were filed, uh, entered into with GVR Consulting Services Private Limited and which was preferential transactions. So the adjudicating authority did not accept the prayers made in the application under section 45 or 66, but declared certain transactions as uh, like uh, as, as uh, preferential. So therefore the adjudicating authority passed, uh, in fact, different, different orders and three appeals, in fact, was filed. Total three appeals were filed by the appellant. Now the, in the three appeals, uh, the issue which was raised by the appellant, whether weight is to be given to the dominant motive of the company in a transaction while deciding the question that the transaction being a preferential under section 43. Whether money arranged from relative by a corporate debtor be held as preferential transaction. So these are the two issues which was raised in this particular judgment, although the other two appeals are still pending. The contentions of the applicant, the applicant who actually has entered into transactions and against whom the order has been passed to return that money whatever preferential treatment has been given. 
Now the appellants in the company appeal are not a related party. They are saying that this GV, GVR is not a related party to the corporate debtor. The transactions held as preferential by the adjudicating authority were related to a loan given to the corporate debtor, which were entered into the ordinary course of business, and such repayments are exempted within the meaning of Section 43. <clears throat> so this company, GVR Consulting Services, gave a loan to the corporate debtor and that was the loan which was being repaid by the corporate data and that was the transaction which was considered as preferential transaction under section 43. Now the resolution professional has no authority to pursue avoidance transactions application like the Venus recruiter case of Union of India like Delhi High Court case was also argued. Then of course this uh, the, the Venus recruiter had finally uh, the, the uh, again from NCLT uh, it was uh, like kind of decided again three bench of the uh, high court also decided against that judgment uh, so the venus recruiter is presently diluted judgment uh, they also refer they referred uh, the ancestral uh, legislative guidelines and also uh, various other arguments and finally the respondent means the uh, the the rp says that the as per the direction of the coc uh, the resolution plan contains a clause that all these realizations out of the avoidance transactions will be distributed amongst the creditors. The payment made in favor of the related parties and non-related parties had the effect of putting the appellant under the beneficial position under section 43. Then the RP relied on Anuj Jain versus Axis Bank, a Supreme Court judgment, and where the argument was that the, the transactions do not fall in ordinary course of uh, business and not covered. Now here I will have to see various other observations, very, very important observations. One observation is that for section 43, no need to prove any fraudulent intent for a preferential transaction. Further, it is also no need to see whether the transaction was whether the act is voluntary or not has no relevance while coming to the conclusion whether the transaction is preferential or not. Now, somebody started arguing that I had to pay because of the check bouncing threats. I had to pay because of the security on my life, a threat on my life. All these arguments are not relevant. The only part is that the person who was paid was lower in the uh, section 53 and he was paid in contravention to his priority so he was given a preferential treatment so these are the uh, observations of ncl80 and even even uh, in in a preferential transaction the mortgage transaction is also preferential so the common law it was explicitly mentioned that the object and purpose of section 43 in the legislative scheme must be kept in consideration while naming a transaction in the ordinary course of business. So <clears throat> NCLT observed that money arranged from relatives and other parties by a corporate debtor cannot be held to be part of an ordinary course of business or part of financial affairs. Undistinguished common flow of the business of the corporate debtor does not contemplate any such or particular situation where the corporate debtors claim that its financial position became unstable due to market conditions and had started arranging money from relatives and other parties that actually is not relevant. <coughs> Some more observations that I could find, those were that we may notice that subsection three of section 43 provides for exception to preferential transactions and proviso to section 3 read, uh, uh, reads as under, provided that any transfer made in pursuance of an order of a court shall not preclude such transfer to be deemed as a giving preference by corporate debtor. So there was only one exception, that is in case any payment is made only on an order from the court. So that is the only exception. Threat pressure is not an exception. The legislative scheme, which is clarified by the above proviso, clearly leads to the conclusion that any transaction under any notice, demand, or threat shall not lose its character of a preferential transaction. 
We thus of the view that submissions of the appellant on the ground that the transaction was entered into by the corporate debtor due to pressure put on it has no relevance and shall not change the nature of the transaction from preferential transaction. I mean, this is something which was very clearly decided that preferential is only mathematical. There is only one exception. So most of the preferential transactions, we will get good results. But there is another observation because see, probably you might have seen in the case of Anuj Jain versus Axis Bank, the Supreme Court has held that the composite applications under section 43, 44, 45, 46, 66, 67 should not be made. That was also one of the argument used that the RP made composite applications. However, in this particular case, Anclad said that although it was a composite application, but the RP has very carefully divided the all the application in different different parts. So therefore, there is no way, there is no point that we should reject that. And final decision of the NCLAT was that it was a professional transaction, it was a preferential transaction, and NCLT upheld the direction and it was likely to be refunded. The money will be refunded. So this was a very important judgment of uh, uh, section 43. So most of the uh, RPs, liquidators, are now free to find out transactions of section 43, preferential nature. So Ankit, we could only handle about four or five judgments. So we actually will come out uh, with a new, uh, it will not be part two. We'll see when to handle this part. And in case we get a new uh, subject for the next week, we will come out with a new subject. Otherwise, we will actually come out with some Supreme Court and some NPLAT judgments. Uh, because see, more than one hour, it, it is actually very difficult to uh, continue. But yes, in case there is any question which can be handled in another two minutes, that can be handled. Uh, no questions per se. I think uh, it's pretty, um, uh, all the questions are already answered. So those have been taken care of. Uh, only one comment here that the right to evict a tenant where the tenancy has expired that we talked about should not be confused with the right of the CD to occupy a premises where the CD is the tenant. So I think many people were talking about the other side that what would be our rights and what would be the SRA's rights with respect to any premises that the CD has taken on rent and how, whether that will continue or not. So there the thought process is that Again, the terms of the lease will continue and the resolution plan there can, of course, talk about what will happen to the lease that the company or the CD is having on any premises which might be used for business by the CD or for whatever purposes. In most of the most of the cases we see that the land or any of the property of the corporate debtor is on 99 years lease from any industrial development corporation of that state. Now, the leasehold right is an asset of the company. And those leasehold rights has a market value also. So the RP and the liquidator will deal with those rights as rights only. They will not treat themselves as the owner. And if they find that there is a value in the leasehold rights, they will sell in the market. And if they see that there is no value in the uh, leasehold rights, then they can even vacate the premises. unless Otherwise, unless they will have to continue with the payment of rent. Yeah, the terms of the lease will decide what will happen to the lease in case the company is liquidated, what will happen to the lease in case the resolution process continues. So, But at the same time, I don't think there is any provision in the in IBC that say a company had a three-year three year lease on a piece of land. The resolution plan can't say that the three years will be extended to nine years. No. You can't change the terms of the lease, but based on the terms of the lease that are available, you mm -hmm. can choose to keep the leases that are assets to the company and dispose those leases which may not be assets of the company. Absolutely, absolutely. So, <clears throat> thank you very much. I think there is uh, some hand raised, but the time is a constraint. I think extending it beyond uh, one hour actually uh, uh, it's something that beyond the discipline that we are maintaining. So, we actually will come up and then we will see in case we can take up any other questions in the coming uh, week. Okay. okay.
Yes, thank you everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and in such large numbers. And it's always a pleasure to uh, discuss all the recent developments in IBC and other subjects. Thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you.